Let me know once we're okay. all set. Okay, we are live. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Act Transportation and Sustainability Committee meeting. I would like to acknowledge that uh, I think most of us are gathered on the territory of the Anishinaabe people, uh, who include the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, who are collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. Uh, and uh, as I've said at our other meetings, I think it's particularly important that we recognize uh, the history uh, of Indigenous stewardship of the land that we are gathered on um, and how the ongoing colonial violence on this land um, has really harmed a lot of Indigenous communities and people. And uh, I know as myself as a settler, uh, I think it's important that uh, we, we commit to um, working in the spirit of reconciliation um, and working towards ending that colonial violence as we uh, are stewards of this land as well. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, I think we should probably do a round of introductions since we do have some new people around the table. So uh, I guess I'll, I'll go quickly first, I think everyone does know me, but uh, I'm Keenan Ellen. I'm the War 2 Councillor for the City of Barrie, which includes the downtown, and I'm the chair of the committee. And we'll do it uh, popcorn style, so you can nominate the next person after you're done introducing yourself. Uh, so next on my screen is John. So go ahead, John. Thanks, Keenan. So my name is John Northcote. Uh, I grew up in Barrie, uh, born in Barrie, grew up in Barrie, and um, I have a consulting, tra a transportation consulting engineering company in Barrie, um, and I'm a member of the community, or sorry, of the committee. And then I'll go to Marianne next. Sorry, Anne-Marie, Marianne. As long as you don't call me Annie, John, then we're all good. <laughs> um, thanks for the tag. So Anne-Marie Kungel, uh, Ward 3 City Councillor and sitting on a range of different committees, but maybe those that tie in, and I'm hoping to speak to that too today, is uh, I'm also on the Seniors Advisory Committee. And last night was appointed to Communities in Bloom. So hopefully we can tie in some and cross-pollinate some opportunities between committee interests. And I'll tag Will. Thanks, Anne-Marie. I'm uh, Wilf, and um, <clears throat> I am the president of the Electric Vehicle Society, so um, I, uh, I have a particular passion about transportation and all things environmental, and um, oh gosh, I don't know half the people here, so I'm going to randomly say Eric. Which one? Uh, I, Eric Van Wiesen... Beck, did I get Wiesen Beek? Right. Did I get that right? You're muted, Eric. Oh, it doesn't show that you're muted. So it seems like an issue there. Well, let's go to the other Eric in the meantime. Eric Jacoby Hawkins, do you want to introduce yourself? You're also on mute. There you go. Can't hear you, though. We're back on mute now. Both Eric's having issues. What's going on here? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Classic. Can you hear me now? So my name is Eric Van Wiesenbeck. Thank you, Will, for the uh, passing it on. And I'm a, a longtime citizen of Barrie, uh, passionate about cycling and, and uh, very interested in active transportation and promoting that in Barrie. Uh, yeah, so that's why I'm on the committee and I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you all. Thank you. Great, thanks oh, Eric. Uh, I should well, let's try the other Eric. Let's sure. see if he's, is your mic working Eric? No, I guess not. How about okay. Brandy Thompson? Let's do that. Sure, she's a staff member, but we'll have her introduce herself anyway, so she's new. Hi Brandy. Welcome. 
you are on mute. Couldn't tell if you were talking because you have a mask on. <laughs> All right, if you can't unmute them. Wow, lots of difficulties this morning. Oh. No. Okay. I don't know what's going on this morning. We're cursed. We're this cursed is Randy. this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Brandy. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, have someone else go out. I'm just going to pick out random here. Let's have Tyler introduce himself next. Sure. I, uh, I was born in Barrie, raised in Barrie, moved away a bit for school, but came back ultimately. Uh, I work as a land use planning consultant in town here, uh, and I am a member of the committee. And with that, I'll pass it along to Al. Says I'm unmuted. Am I unmuted? You're good. Okay. So I'm Al McNair. I'm the conservation chair for uh, Nature Berry, which is a, a naturalist uh, club that's been running in Berry for, well, we're getting close to 70 years now, I guess. Uh, I've only lived in Berry since 1976, which makes me a relative newcomer to some of these young guys who grew up here. Uh, and uh, I've been on the past uh, environmental advisory committee and on the active transportation working group and uh, so, uh, and I'm a retired land use planner. I, Tyler, <laughs> Tyler has the same bad background, <laughs> so, but maybe he'll do better. Thank you. Thanks, Al. All right, picking at random again here. Kelly Patterson McGrath, welcome. How about you introduce yourself? We're so happy to have you here as a new member. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'm excited. Um, newly appointed to the committee. Um, I'm very passionate about our city. I love cycling. I love paddling. Um, I'm very interested in helping the city mitigate climate change and looking toward um, really feeling the connection, you know, in this committee and this group. I'm very, very excited to be part of it. I'm, I'm uh, semi-retired. Uh, my background is strategic planning, uh, facilitation, and, and uh, uh, training. And I am also a Pilates teacher. So I um, love being outside and outdoors. And I absolutely, completely love our city. And uh, very excited to lend a hand and work as a team. That's great. Thanks, Kelly. All right. Cheryl, how about you introduce yourself? I love this committee. This is great. Um, I am a city, a Barry staff member. I am the city's disability management and accessibility specialist. Um, I've worked for the city since 2010. I am not originally from Ontario. I'm originally from uh, Western Canada, but I also love Barry. So um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, all right, we'll go to Adam next, if you want to introduce yourself. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Um, Adam McMullen, I'm a city staff member. Uh, I am the manager of energy. So uh, a lot of what I do touches, I guess, with this committee. Um, I did not grow up in Barrie, but I grew up south of Barrie in the hamlet of Loretto. So I'm very familiar with uh, Barry, uh, often I would lose um, in sports to Barry because they were much bigger schools and much better at us. Uh, at us. So that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right, Brett. Go ahead. Hello, everybody. I'm Brett Gratrix. I'm the supervisor of transportation planning. Uh, we look after the long range strategic management of the city's corridors, as well as active transportation implementation. Thanks, Brett. And Kevin. Hello, Kevin. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kevin Rankin, the manager of Parks and Forestry Operations. Um, I'm generally the person who can answer some questions about any parks or forestry related items when it comes to operational. Awesome. 
Thanks, Kevin. And uh, Tara, how about you introduce yourself too? Such a key piece of making this work. We're so thankful. Oh, and I unmuted too. I figured it out. Awesome. <laughs> I'm not sure what's going on with our technology. Hers is actually also a, a, a new computer too. So what awesome. can you do? Uh, so I'm Tara MacArthur. I've actually been with the city almost 18 years now. I uh, worked in the clerk's office for about 17. Um, and I am the recording secretary, organizer, all the above. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Tara. Uh, okay, Eric, let's try it. Eric Jacoby Hawkins. Oh, here we go. I heard you laugh. Oh, wow. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Eric Jacoby Hawkins, uh, almost two decade member of uh, Living Green Berry and um, member of the precursor to this committee for a number of years, active transportation. And uh, really thrilled the committee's uh, up and running well this year with two attending and actively engaged councillors. Oh, Eric throwing some shade. All right. <laughs> so let's move to our first agenda item. Uh, we've got the Community Energy Plan and Greenhouse Gas Reduction Plan update. So we've invited uh, Adam to sort of just provide a brief update of the work of that group. Uh, the stakeholder advisory group is, is, uh, has been meeting on a regular basis. Um, to develop that plan and we just wanted to have uh, sort of a casual conversation with Adam about where that's at. So Adam, take it away. Sure, and uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to chat about this. Uh, the Community Energy and Greenhouse Gas Emission Planning Exercise has actually been uh, a long winding road. It Council approved the capital uh, funds for this in 2018. Um, we applied for ministry funding and were approved, but then there was a transition in government. So there was a delay in the commencement of the plan process for a number of months until I guess we got formal approval in the spring of 2019. And we hired a consultant, Lura, um, their leader when it comes to community engagement and uh, development of these types of plans. And the first major step to that activity was actually starting the data request. So um, part of this exercise is uh, soliciting data from the utilities, from different sources, MPAC, uh, the city, and overlaying all of that data together in order to map out energy and greenhouse gas emission intensity within the community. And the uh, so solicitation of the data actually took six months. Uh, and the biggest one was Electra, uh, was the, the delay, but we were able to get that data. Um, uh, concurrently, while we were doing that, we established a stakeholder advisory group, and that group uh, is representative of a number of different organizations within the city. Uh, it has representation from the city. Uh, Councillor Keenan's on it, a very active member. We have the trans, uh, uh, department, uh, transit departments involved, planning's involved, uh, sustainability's involved, and my group's involved, of course. So then there's a number of different organizations. Um, conservation authorities, school board. Um, I have a, I had a list I read prior to, and I can't think of them right now, but um, Wilf is a, is a member through the EV Society. We have a member of the Ontario Architects Association and there's Living Green as a representative. So we have a number of different organizations that are involved to oversee um, the development of the plan. And what um, so we established that group and concurrently we got the data and established a baseline and that baseline is for 2018 and it looks at the energy and emissions that are um, the emissions from the community and the energy consumed by the community in 2018 and what we did is we've analyzed that baseline and with this stakeholder advisory group we've developed principles visions and big moves which we've called in terms of what activities and strategies we want to look at in order to reduce our emissions and our energy consumption and the major findings of where we are so far. So we, we've, we've kind of worked through four meetings and we're now to the point where we've developed kind of some strategies is, is focused on the two main ones are buildings and transportation. And um, the two major findings, I think 95% emissions come from buildings and come from 
uh, the transportation sector and the, the big moves or the activities that we're looking to develop are related to those two areas. So uh, the main one would be in, within the buildings areas to retrofit existing housing stock, particularly residential houses to increase energy efficiency and reduce um, the uses of, of natural gas specifically. And then on the uh, transportation side is to electrify our fleet or our, our vehicles and also to move people away from vehicle use into active transportation and public transit. So that is a very quick uh, summary of, of what we've done. Uh, we've had some public engagement so, so far and we are moving through further meetings with the stakeholder advisory group and look to have a final plan adopted by council by the fall of 2021. That's great. Thanks, Adam. Uh, so questions, I think I saw Anne-Marie's hand, so let's start with her. Thanks, Keenan. Um, Adam, let me know if this doesn't fit, but maybe how it intersects. So uh, I'm interested in conversations about how we can also uh, increase ridership and also different incentives that were also uh, minded towards individuals on lim limited income, seniors, um, uh, visually impaired. Um, and so I think BC has actually done some work there where they've uh, actually made transit for certain riders or certain subgroups within the resident community free. And I didn't know if we saw that as a strategy to also push ridership um, and if that's tied into your work around what could be potential incentives to, as we move towards strategies around the e-bus, and we've got, I think we saw some investments, what, a couple of years ago around that, and the intention being identified through the city of Barrie around moving towards replacing our fleet in time to, um, to be electric. Um, but until then, like, is there a strategy that targets ridership from a, how do we just help people use that system that's available if it's more affordable? And uh, in addition, look at transit route additions. Um, but I didn't know if you could speak to that at all or how you intersect with some traffic service uh, planning. Great question. Um, so this plan will, it's kind of bucketing things. So one is transportation. Obviously that's a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions. And then within that, there's gonna be a number of, of high level strategies. And one will be, um, moving from the, the personal vehicle to public transit. And the specifics around the implementation of that will be uh, a future activity. Uh, so we're not gonna lay down that, uh, how do we specifically move people to uh, public transit? The, the scope of that would be too large, but there's obviously a connection point between transit services and other departments within the city when it comes to that. And how do you ensure that certain populations have access to that? and like uh, you know vulnerable populations or, or students and that type of thing so uh, there's definitely that is important um, the level of detail to get to that point where we're identifying a, a specific strategy uh, won't be an outcome of this but it'll be identified as a need for future action uh, I struggled with this because I was like I was getting to the point where I'm like well, listing things I need to do and we want to do and it's like no we have to figure out here are the broad things and then moving forward we need to tackle these five top priorities when it comes to this this plan that's helpful if i can follow up and maybe it's um where i have some learning to do but sometimes i feel it's kind of like that catch 22 or the conversation around um you know build bike lanes and they will come but if they're not safe bike lanes you're not going to see individuals you know moving into that space or if they're not kind of socialized there feel comfortable there and so is there a tipping point where the strategy and what you're working on you know, is going to be evaluated or you're, you're, you might struggle to move forward if you don't see ridership at a certain threshold. So is there anything we could be working on around activation of individuals in ridership and in adopting uh, transit as a method uh, that supports where you need to go that helps build the case for why it's important and other resources tied to that strategy? Um, it sounds, all that sounds logical. I, I'm not a transportation expert and uh, I would have to defer to those in, in the city, city staff that do that. I think that makes sense. And I've always had that consideration, the chicken before the egg, do you need ridership in order to expand ridership or do you provide more ridership to get more ridership? But I'm not the expert on that. I, I would assume that 
they are looking at that and this would there'd have to be synergies and integration between what we recommend and what is planet being planned for in the future um, and that's a bit of a challenge too because sustainability greenhouse gas mitigation activities they they touch so many different things and you have to ensure that what you are doing makes sense and aligns with all the other strategies of the city i'm not just, sure if that helped <laughs> just quickly quickly jumping in on that um normally we do have uh mike mcconnell who's a transit planner at uh, at our meetings um and i know we have had conversations with him about um these types of initiatives and i believe Council has provided direction um, to look at uh, free transit for high school students, and we still haven't received the full report back on that. Um, so that's one opportunity that's available. Um, and I know the mayor had raised recently with council the idea of uh, discounted or free transit for people on ODSP or OW. Um, so those are some options to explore. Maybe we can have uh, an agenda item where we, we have Mike McConnell from Transit come in and we can talk about the progress of, of that, if that makes sense. And Emory, you still have the floor if, if you have other questions or comments. Uh, I don't wanna take up the time. If I've, I've got one more again, I, this is where I might be reaching Adam about um, relatability, but um, I'm curious about where we look at different bylaws. So it fits more maybe an urban design and planning, um, but things like initiatives around exploring installing green roofs. So Toronto's got a bylaw, I guess, that looked at um, developments over 2000 square meters to install a green roof. And that was initiated in 2009. So I'm curious about that and how those types of initiatives, when you talk about uh, greenhouse gases and buildings, if that's in scope too, or where you intersect with different departments. Great, great question. Uh, that definitely does sit within this, this activity and it sits within the building focus of greenhouse gas emission mitigation. Uh, buildings account for 40% of emissions. So targeting uh, future building and existing building efficiencies is, is important. Uh, the city of Toronto has a, a, a the Toronto a green building standard and they're kind of the gold plated uh, thing that everyone looks to and what they've done is they have established corporately a standard that is very aggressive for when it comes to carbon emission and energy efficiency and what they've done is they have a lag where then the public entity or public and private development five years after which have to follow a more stringent standard so you constantly improve and become more effective when it comes to new construction and retrofits and, and that type of thing um, so Enacting um, a green building standard is something that uh, a lot of municipalities are doing, a lot of entities are doing. There is a, a unique uh, circumstance with the city of Toronto's, they have more authority under the, I forget the act, but Toronto is able to require their construction to exceed the building code. Um, and we don't have that true ability at, at within the uh, at city of Barrie. So there would be a, a large benefit from having a more aggressive building code established that targets some of these things that we're looking at when it comes to carbon neutrality, uh, energy efficiency. It doesn't mean we can't still enact bylaws that support developments that do this, or there's, you know, you can offer carrots where there's, uh, uh, you, you provide uh, re rebates and development funds and that type of thing when it comes to construction that meets certain sustainability um, metrics. So that is definitely on the radar for this plan. And an outcome of this will, will be to develop a green building standard, both for the corporate operations of the city, but also for all of the other development within the city. And I'm sorry, I'm taking up time here, but I can, if I can move this to a potential next step, Adam or other staff, and I guess to the committee as a whole, I would love to have more conversation about that. I was going to launch it as a conversation piece, not knowing that you um, were probably my, a resource this morning, Adam, at City Building and ask for a presentation or discussion to kind of identify a couple of things. Do Does anyone know, um, or Adam, are you aware if this information when we talk about opportunities is kind of forecasted to get tracked into our new official plan? Is this an area I think where um, we are already seeing that integration and there won't be a missed opportunity if we don't get it on an agenda soon? 
So I, I just recently went through an exercise with the, cons the consulting company that's working on this plan, uh, it, additional scope of work to do a review of the official plan draft through the lens of climate mitigation. And they, we, they went through every line and we identified a number of areas that we need to have the appropriate wording so that we are enabled in the future to develop policies that align with the official plan. Um, and I'm of the same nature. I don't wanna miss us including somewhere in this official plan, something that allows us to do something really good down the road. Uh, so I've worked with planning to review that and the comments were due, I guess, at the end of December. And now they're integrating those within the next uh, iteration of that plan. So we have definitely done that. And uh, in particular, when it comes to the green devel development standard, we looked at that to say in the future, the city can develop uh, policies and um, standards that can be incorporated into future development approval. Um, and there's different ways to do that. But from what I understand, you just have to make sure you have the overall governance within the official plan to allow that. You just can't have something that's really offside and say, I want to do this if you haven't referred to an official plan. And um, the planner who's on this, who, who works from the city on the, on the, on the plan development uh, it is, is the one I spoke to. So we have a bit of alignment there. All right. So next step, I guess, is I don't need to take this to city building to look <laughs> at interest in, in actually putting um, uh, some type of progress forward that's intentional about a green roof bylaw or integrating it that this is something that's on its way and I should wait for the <clears throat> official plan to close and then come back and have a conversation about what does that mean around our practice approach with uh, planning and uh, I'm going to jump in here there's just one one comment there's many uh, components to a green uh, development standard and it can be from a green roof it can be from uh, renewable deployment it can be from uh, design considerations, orientation. So it, it's very encompassing. Um, so when you develop a standard, it can capture many things and can do many things when it comes from a sustainability perspective. Fantastic. Keenan? Yeah, Al, go ahead. Um, just, just uh, I, I would uh, wholeheartedly support what Anne-Marie is, uh, is advocating here. Um, and the context we're dealing with is we have proposals for that are going through rezoning and we'll be going through site plan approvals and stuff right now for buildings bigger than anything that could be twice the height of or more of anything that we've seen in Barrie in the past. And we either do it right now or we will be stuck with those. And there is, and Tara, I know you can find this probably faster and easier than I, but council in past council adopted Resolute, a resolution, a recommendation from the previous Environmental Advisory Committee about the buildings, all buildings uh, that the city itself would be constructing. And I believe there's also something in there about uh, really promoting um, the, uh, I don't know if it's specifically referenced LEED standards, but essentially energy efficient buildings and stuff. So there is already, by decision of city council, and as far as I've heard, it's never been repealed, um, that points in that direction. Uh, Tara, I don't know how difficult it would be for you to find that, um, uh, that resolution. I can't remember if it was in the pre, if it was in the, the committee from the, the first four years or the second four years of the Environmental Advisory Committee but there were, you did some documentation on that for us and there weren't, it wasn't like a hundred pages that you'd have to hunt through, uh, but I, that might be useful to circulate to the, to the committee. And, um, and, and I think it's imperative, uh, particularly some of these things may be possible to do through site plan uh, requirements. And I don't know what there is because I have not tried to digest the couple hundred pages of new proposed uh, urban design guidelines. My suspicion is that that may be where a lot of that should be. Um, but um, anyway, um, councils can be making decisions and giving, you know, giving approvals and, and uh, this, this needs to be done now or we're, uh, we're building our own, we're building our own coffins instead of our own future. 
Thanks, Al. Uh, do we have uh, other questions on this piece, Kelly? Thank you, um, Adam, for the, the uh, overview. I know there's lots of data, I'm sure, but uh, it was nice and deep. From what I, what I gather you're saying, when you're referring to Toronto's excellent uh, green build plan. Sorry, Kelly, your mic is cutting in and out. I'm not sure oh, what's going yes. on, if you can move closer or something. Okay, is this better? That is better. Yep. Better? Great, okay. Um, so their particular plan it requires uh, building code uh, changes. And so from what I'm hearing, is this something that needs to be driven uh, from our building codes, the city of Barrie's building codes, and they need to change to align to that? Is that, is that what I hear? Um, yeah, again, I'm, I'm not an expert when it comes to this, but uh, the building code is governed uh, prov provincially. So it's a mandate that's set. Um, Toronto has a unique circumstance where they are excluded from that requirement because I think they have their own powers. Uh, so uh, they, they have the ability to go above and beyond and enact their own legislative and regulatory requirements when it comes to this. Uh, the city of Barrie and essentially everyone else does not have that ability. So from my understanding, you can't require someone to exceed or a builder to exceed the building code uh, that's established by the province. That's the thing. City of Toronto is the City of Toronto Act, and it gives them a lot of powers that I would love if we had. Nice. The, yes, Al. The, yeah. the City of Barrie also has, because municipalities are all governed under the Municipal Act, yeah. but the City of Toronto, yes, they have a whole bunch of other stuff. But the City of Barrie also has probably, uh, I suspect it's not just one, there may be a, a bunch of them, I don't know, but there have been City of Barrie Acts that dealt with specific areas of jurisdiction or powers and the, i'm sure the clerk's office could uh, could you know bring us up to speed on that but um there may be uh, opportunities and i'm not sure about this uh, but there may be opportunities for barry to uh get some additional powers um mm -hmm. municipalities used to have um and i don't know if any still do uh, but they used to have building regulations that uh, in some communities that were in excess of the Ontario building code. Uh, I don't know if it's still, if, if they could still, Barry could still do that or not. Um, but uh, as I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, there is still, there's already a policy context uh, that council adopted um, that can, that can sort of take you in, uh, in, in that direction. Okay. All right. Th thanks, Al. Uh, Wilf, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thanks, Keenan. Um, so is there a provision or is there is there a way to uh, um, uh, address this through zoning and through some other mechanisms other than building code? I understand we're restricted that we can't we can't um, go above and beyond what the province sets. But do we have other mechanisms to uh, to help us with some of what we're trying to do? I can try and jump in there, uh, Wilf. Um, I again, I'm not an expert in this. I think you can provide a carrot in the sense that uh, you could provide a sustainable design checklist framework, and if developments you know meet a certain criteria or points, and they get uh, a reduction in development charges, that's what a lot of other entities are doing, uh, and it has had some success. Uh, I don't know about other avenues when it comes to zoning bylaws and that uh, in order to kind of move to the requirements that we're looking to do from a greenhouse gas mitigation perspective, but that's what I understand has been used so far. And uh, the city, we do have a, a community improvement plan, which is an incentive program for incenting certain types of development. Right now we're uh, focusing on affordable housing. Um, there's a small portion of it for heritage uh, properties. Uh, and then also a redevelopment grant um, focused on the Urban Growth Center and uh, Brownfields. Um, but we're, to be honest, we are having difficulty even funding that uh, program as it exists now. So adding another incentive program would probably be a challenge, but that's, my understanding is that's one of the few tools available to us in terms of incentivizing that type of, of development. But uh, Will, if you still have the floor, if you have 
other questions or comments. You're good. All right, I see John's hand. Go ahead. Thanks, Ken. Um, and thanks, Adam, for the presentation. Um, yeah, Mike, I guess my question is about the targets that you're saying. I'm not sure if, do you guys have targets that, you mean, you talked about a baseline. Do you have a set of targets that you're looking to hit by a certain period? Or will the plan identify the targets that you're going to hit? And, and will, will there be levels that, you know, you're, you're suggesting that you could go to? Uh, thanks, John. Yes, the, the plan will, will establish targets and the committee is, or the stakeholder advisory group is in the process of, of maneuvering through what that looks like. And there's two main targets. One is 80% below baseline by 2050. And the other more aggressive target is a, a net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And it's interesting. Now we're at the point where we're able to map the strategies that we've identified against the baseline and see where that takes us. And now we're to the point where we're discussing with the stakeholder advisory group. We're here, we're, we're close to maybe the 80%, um, not, maybe not quite. What do we wanna do in order on, on targets and what do we wanna look at? So this plan will definitely establish targets and that's part of the whole process. And then those will be brought forth to, to council. So, so it will be, um, sorry if I can go back again. Uh, sure. It'll be a set, uh, you, you'll recommend targets and some measures to achieve those targets, but it won't be kind of presented to council as you can hit these separate targets. You're, you're, you're planning on having, making a recommendation for the targets you suggest to hit and then methods on hitting that. Is that, is that the idea? Yeah. So it's, it, so it's like bucketed strategy. So one area is say buildings. We know it's 40% of our emissions. So one component of a strategy is to do deep retrofits uh, and mainly target at residential, the residential sector. So if, that's a strategy that the, the group thinks makes sense and uh, it becomes part of the plan. Then that gets us to say, you know, 60% towards our target. And then you have a bucket of strategies that get you towards your target. And the specifics about the program aren't outlined. So we don't know what that looks like when it comes to the actual deployment of a, say a residential deep retrofit program, because that'd be too much work for this particular plan, but we'll identify these main strategies. And uh, where we are now, we're finding we we've, we've We've done the major things to get us close to that target. And now the committee and group has to figure out, okay, well, do we want to target zero? What does that look like? Do we understand there's going to be a gap? Or do we want to say we want to get more aggressive with some strategies and that type of thing? So I don't know if I answered your question, but that's kind of how it lays out when it comes to developing the targets and where we get to. Yeah, no, that's great. That's that's perfect. Um, and then I had yeah, another question about, like, are, are, are you thinking your stakeholder group would stay on through the implementation and monitoring of this? Or... Or will, that, will that be, you know, one of the recommendations to keep that stakeholder group going through throughout this to watch how it goes? And the mandate of the, of the advisory group would would uh, end at the end of the at the end of the uh, plan development, but there will be some sort of recommendation within the plan about uh, implement, implementation, maintenance, and oversight from this. And I don't know if that would be a committee of council, if that would be a uh, a public working group with uh, in the same format that is now it's it's not identified, but there will be something in there because you have to have continuation that oversees these types of things. Yeah, it just seems like you have such a good group there. It would be great to be able to keep that group continuing on to um, watch. I mean, you know, to see how the financials of it work for. But uh, yeah, that was my one. And um, oh yeah, no, actually, I think I think you got everything there. Yeah, thanks, Adam. It is an excellent group. They're great to work with. Thanks. Uh, so uh, you raise, raise a really important point too, John, around accountability. Um, I think that's going to be the challenge here is how do we uh, how do we ensure that we get the funding for the programs that we need to meet these targets? Uh, like I know the city's um, climate adaptation strategy, there are parts of that strategy that have not been implemented years later. Um, and so we kind of need to look at building in an accountability piece. And uh, I would suggest that as a committee, when that report from the stakeholder advisory group uh, comes forward, we, we have a look at it as well. And if um, we can raise concerns or ideas uh, then, which will be in the fall. Um, I see Eric's hand up and then I saw Anne-Marie as well. Go ahead, Eric. Thank you, Keenan. Thanks for uh, filling us in on, on the plan, Adam. Um, just a question, does the plan address or account for, or at least acknowledge 
um, the delivery of alternate energy, replacing greenhouse gas, replacing uh, uh, natural gas, I guess, supply in that electricity will have to come into the city to replace some of that energy. And the infrastructure to deliver that electricity is, is pretty key that with the shift in demand that that will be uh, accounted for. Is that, is that considered in the plan or at least acknowledged? Eric, yeah, that's a very good point. Um, one of the major strategies to, to, to get to, to new carbon zero emissions is to electrify because electricity is a low carbon energy source right now. And to do that, that's uh, replacing essentially natural gas and a lot of the heating that we do uh, with electricity and that will cause a large, that'll, that'll have a significant impact on infrastructure, especially um, when it comes to bringing electricity in. Uh, the, the plan isn't going to, to deal with that aspect that we require significant infrastructure um, specifically, but we do have a lecture at the table um, and they are aware that this is coming down and they know that electrification of both transportation and uh, essentially building heating is coming. So they're at the table, they'll be able to, they understand this is coming and their long range planning, they're regulated and how they do that will is going to start to account for this because it is significant. And when I do some math, when it look like electri electrifying our fleet, the, the, the numbers are significant and um, it is definitely an important factor. This won't, this will speak to that, the plan will speak to this, but it's not gonna provide strategies about that aspect of bringing and ensuring the infrastructure and that's that's a partner um, kind of work and in, in electors at the table uh, which is great understood thank you the, the main thing is that, that you have the partner at the table considering it that's what i was wondering thanks yeah and bridge is at the table too and sometimes yeah. we yeah. we trash them and blame them <laughs> yeah just kidding uh all right amory go ahead i was wondering because we're talking about the work that um, that group is doing, Adam, and, and information, but is there a process piece where that report can come back to this committee? I guess I'm looking at what's the opportunity for us, if it's appropriate or if there's interest, to have a position to um, push or advocate um, or at least see this before it goes to council. Because um, I'm hearing a couple of things that have a relationship. Like I'd I'd love to make sure that we're not missing an opportunity around enacting a green building standard, but I'm hearing, you know, there could be a plethora of different options around what falls under that. So what, what would we like to see strategically that the city is taking on? And then through that, you know, what is that sustainable design checklist? I've had great conversations with Margaret Profit from the Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition. Like, why don't, you know, how could we possibly have a nice summary checklist with every planning um, and development coming forward that just says, here's your missions, you know, where do we want to recommend we take a zero tolerance and, and how do we incentivize whether or not we actually have the carrots, but how are we actually making a bit of a declaration to say these are the things that we value. Uh, uh, and these are the things we want builders to comment on and strive for uh, if we don't have formal levers. And then within that, as Keenan, you're saying the client climate adaptation strategy, like where are we at? How are we bringing that back to the table? And what are the opportunities to ensure there's some continuance or conversation of Adam's group so we can retain that knowledge capital and actually position it as a driver for where we are trying to make some gains at least before the next term. Um, many questions there uh, to unpack them all, but I guess the first one is uh, the touch point with this committee. Uh, uh, Councillor Alwyn is, is a member of that stakeholder advisory group, so is Wilf. And uh, I think if there's an appetite for this group to review that material, that can be done. Um, I forgot to add that we are bringing an update to council on uh, general, sorry, general committee at the end of the month. So that will be a presentation and staff report providing the background of where we are and in, in the strategies and that type of thing. But I think what you're thinking about is more about digging into the strategies and having some comment and feedback. So. Um, there's a mechanism where there's members of that stakeholder advisory group that sit within this group. And if we want to find a way to review the material uh, at whatever point or, or have a checkpoint, that's totally, totally makes sense. I think that's a good idea. And I think it would inform the group about all the things we're looking at so that all these synergies that you, you plan to talk about in the future, you'll have, you'll, you'll understand, okay, that's the link when it comes to greenhouse gas mitigation. So that's definitely there. Um, 
and all those other those other comments about ensuring we captured green development standards. Um, I think that's a larger conversation, but it's, it's obviously very important. Yeah, and um, I think two things. Uh, I think we can we can make sure that the staff report and the presentation that's later this month is circulated to this committee, um, and then I think it would be useful for us to have a meeting where we go over the, the final strategy before it goes to council. We don't wanna delay the work at all. So we could even set up a special uh, meeting of this committee uh, if needed. Um, Tara's face when I said a special meeting. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's something we, we, can, we can look at. So let's, Adam, let's stay connected on, on when that final report will be coming. I guess as a member of the stakeholder advisor, I'll probably be aware, but um, we can make sure that that happens. Kelly, I see your hand. Thank you. Hi, Adam. I, I've got one more, one more question around the, um, as I understand, you're saying that 40% uh, of the, the measurement that was done in 2018 is related to buildings. The rest of that is transportation. Is that, is that kind of the split? Yeah, the 50, I think 55%. So 95% of emissions are transportation and, and building. Right. And, and my question within that transportation bundle is, did we do uh, include the measurement of the, the use of our maintenance equipment, our two cycle equipment that we're using, gas powered equipments that we use to, uh, to maintain our city? Was that included in that piece? Are you referring to, I guess, like uh, cutting grass, uh, that type of equipment? Blowers, yeah. Uh, all that kind of, um, you know, the two cycle gas <laughs> powering GHC emitting equipment that we use to maintain. Yes, that stuff. I'll have to speak to the, the modelers. There's uh, methodologies that are used to extrapolate uh, emissions from different sources. I don't think we explicitly detail that to that granularity. There might be assumptions based on population that this much emissions are associated with that equipment, um, but I can bring that back to the committee. Uh, it's, it's very rigorous. Uh, the the baseline process it's a internationally followed protocol so there is a capture of that and once you dig into it, it's very interesting because we're on the water so there's a, a proration to how much emissions are, are related to marine equipment and that type of thing so there's there's it's very um robust but i can i can ask that question because i'm interested now myself <clears throat> question wilf i see your mm -hmm. name again and then out we'll go to al after wilf go ahead wilf yeah thanks kid and just a follow-on um Adam, if I remember correctly, I think one of the reconciliations they did was um, against fossil fuel dispensed, um, which would capture that quantity. Is, uh, do I remember correctly on that? Yes, good call, good catch, Wolf. Uh, I think there is a survey on fuel usage, and I think that's how they, or inventory on fuel usage. So that would capture uh, emissions associated with gasoline, um, whether it, I guess it'd be emitted from a an engine versus a two-stroke engine, but there is that that is definitely, I think, the measure that's used to capture that. Um, I'll verify. Thanks. All right, Al and then Eric after that. Yeah, thanks. And then I do want to wrap up this conversation soon. Um, Go ahead. Just, um, Adam, I, I hope that in the report which you're you're preparing for council at the uh, by the end of the month, that um, you can tie this back to some very critical timelines. We know that while the, the federal government plans and everything else talk about doing achieving certain targets by 2030, by 2050, uh, whatever, but we know that we have probably about 10 years to start doing something very serious about this, uh, perhaps even radical to get, you know, to start getting greenhouse gas levels down. And um, so I would encourage you to include reference, very strong reference in your report to the urgency, the time urgency of this. We, we've had a bit of discussion this morning on all kinds of things that could be done, but if council, if Barry Council does not see the urgency on this coming through loud and strong, it will, like many things, it, it will get a, a polite nod and it won't get nothing much will happen. And that's the slippery slope 
to hell. So please <laughs> do that's how you really you feel now. Draft. No, that's that's an important point, Al. Thank you for for raising that. Um, I mean, council did declare a climate emergency, so I hope there's some understanding around the table that it is an emergency. Um, so let's let's keep pushing for sure. Um, it wasn't okay. a spending item, Keenan. <laughs> no, you're right about that. Uh, Eric, we'll go to you, and then I'd like to move on to the next agenda item, if that's okay. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm patiently waiting uh, for the uh, sub item on the agenda. Are we moving to that next? And that's the piece around the uh, local improvement charges, right? Yes. So, so Adam, this is something we've talked about as a, a committee. And um, can you give us a sense? Is this something that we're looking at as a strategy as part of the, the greenhouse gas reduction plan? To, yeah, to I mean, do those sure. retrofits that you talked about? And maybe I'll just step back quickly. Uh, local improvement charges, uh, there's regulation in Ontario that allows municipalities to establish programs whereby which residents can uh, implement retrofits at their house and then the cost of that uh, be applied to their tax rate, the meaning that you can prorate that over years on your taxes. And then the benefit of that retrofit sits with the, 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 the actual home. And if you sell that home, then the next uh, owner of the home pays for it, but also realizes the benefit. So there's legislation that's been enacted on that. And this committee did uh, send a, a request about looking into partnership with the city of Vaughan. And um, that was late last year, or that was last year. And um, I did speak to Vaughan and then COVID quickly hit and turned my life upside down. Um, but where we sit with that is the, we've been approached by the Clean Air Partnership, um, who is working with AMO, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, to uh, participate in a market characterization study. And that, that is a prerequisite uh, through the Green Municipal Fund to apply for future funding that could be act as seed money to support a program like this. Um, it's a bit convoluted, but essentially what it does is it says, here's the magnitude of the opportunity when it comes to retrofits for residential homes. And, and this is what it looks like. And then it recommends an approach forward, that study. Uh, th there's no cost to the city. Um, so it looks like that's a really good benefit. And then the next step would be to say, okay, we wanna apply for funding and then we wanna implement a program. Uh, the Clean Air, Air Partnership and AMO are looking to develop an administrative third-party turnkey um, service that municipalities can opt into that will cover those activities. So instead of establishing a, a system within the city, um, we opt in and we just have to ensure that we have the bylaws and processes that allow us to um, you know, capture those costs and, and, and facilitate the, the bureaucracy of that. But essentially, that's what we're looking at. So the first step is we're involved in that characterization study. And to, uh, to step back, the one strategy of, of deep retrofits in the, the, the plan that we're developing, that is the main, one of the main activities that is required in order to be successful. And a program like this is, is one area that could be used to, to achieve that. However, they, the one challenge with these is that they, they're not that successful. The uptake isn't that great. The City of Toronto has one, and they have very few participants. It, it does still have that market barrier that um, you could be a homeowner or you, you could be a renter, and there's all these barriers. So uh, it's not just using that, but it's expanding the scope of that to make sure it's an effective program that actually uh, moves towards deep retrofits and I think that's one thing we have to look at is not just using that one tool but is there a way to augment that with other activities that kind of gets us to those deep retrofits that we need. Thanks Adam. Eric did you have a follow-up on that at all or? Um, yes I just want to to really emphasize that um, most of the other measures discussed earlier, whether it's uh, building code or uh, zoning or incentives, um, none of those will reduce any of our emissions, um, even a, a smidgen. Um, all they will do is, is help limit increase in emissions from new development and, and building. Um, but our existing building stock, I believe, exceeds any currently envisioned additional growth. 
I don't think we're uh, anticipating a doubling in, in the next period. So uh, to reduce our emissions, we really need to address that. And I think um, this financing by itself uh, isn't going to, to do it, but I think it makes it leverages all of the other programs, whether they're uh, incentives or subsidies or uh, information or promotion, um, any of the other ones, this just makes it easier uh, takes away some of the barriers to financing. Um, just to review for people who aren't familiar with it, because uh, local improvement charges, which are traditionally used for uh, mandatory uh, city initiated improvements, like uh, running a new uh, uh, sewer line down a street that didn't have one, um, they impose the costs on the building owners, but then it's spread out over a number of years and collected through the property tax system and it does uh, carry forward with the building so the owners don't have to pay for an improvement uh, they don't benefit from if they sell uh, the building. And um, that also means it doesn't go as, it doesn't register as a loan against the owner's credit. They don't have to apply for the financing, they don't have to qualify, and it doesn't count against them uh, if they're doing any other borrowing. So um, if we use that system, it's easier for uh, investors who have uh, need to use their credit to purchase properties and finance them. This doesn't add to their financing burden as well as for homeowners. It doesn't require taking out a second mortgage or any other financing against their credit. And for um, apartment buildings, for example, it's a lot easier as a finance tool. So I think to see this as a key part of a, an integrated approach, um, I think is important to make all of the other things we talk about more tenable and, and um, finding a way to promote it so it has a higher uptake, obviously, be a um, high priority. But I think it's a no-brainer that we would, you know, take part in this study. Um, even if none of the study and subsidy didn't exist, it would seem like a worthwhile project to look at. Um, the fact that there's funding available to help set up uh, the program and uh, if there's a shared program with multiple municipalities, that's fantastic. So I think uh, we should strongly urge to go ahead with, you know, all due haste and then keep this in mind as we look at um, other measures. For sure, for sure. Tyler, I see your hand and then we'll move to the next item. You're on mute. Of course I am. Um, I guess I was more generally trying to understand uh, what is meant by a deep retrofit or if there is even like an accepted uh, definition of the term and related or second question, I suppose, um, have other jurisdictions such as Toronto and Ontario anyway, targeted certain types of retrofits? Like I'm, I'm thinking for instance, replacing old windows versus replacing old inefficient attic insulation. And then sort of along that same line of thinking, are there ways or proven ways which a municip municipality can be selective in the types of projects that they choose to finance, maybe be cost effective with their financing solutions for some of the more um, impactful renovations, I suppose. Um, and then lastly, is not directly related, but I, I, I know I've brought this up in the past, but Halifax has an excellent uh, solar city program. It's been around for a number of years now. It sounds structurally very similar to what's being proposed here. It just happens to be centered around um, solar um, in that case. Um, and and I, I believe it's been quite impactful in terms of um, reduction in, in their emissions, given the scale of the program. Now that said, uh, there's a lot of oil burning furnaces still in Halifax. Um, and I know that's not the case in Ontario. So, Thanks, Tyler. Uh, a lot of questions there. I guess the first one is uh, deep retrofit. And I guess there's no, there's no well-defined definition, but essentially it's different than the traditional retrofit where you just put in a high efficiency furnace or something like that, or, you know, you change out your lights, which cons are considered a retrofit. A deep retrofit is when you look at holistically the building, in particular the heating, and you say, okay, how can we reduce the heating requirements of a building through insulation, windows, air tightness, uh, and you, you go deeper than 
what would be traditionally done. And the challenge is those costs associated and the payback associated with that make the economics not that great. Uh, I have a very cold 1970s house and to put insulation on the outside of my house is gonna be $20,000. I would never recoup that cost, but that would be considered kind of a deep energy retrofit activity. Um, and the other question is, and, or number of questions was, have other entities or have they targeted certain strategies like windows or insulation? And what often is the case is that there is a mix mash of different incentive programs that you can navigate. So Enbridge may have a program by which you could put insulation in and the previous provincial government had a very uh, significant subsidy to do, to do window replacement. And I think the challenge is to navigate those systems and to, to do it holistically is makes is, is a lot of work and a lot of people aren't it's not accessible to a lot of people and if you combine those values of those incentive programs and, and made it you know simpler simple then you could leverage that money to make those deep retrofits actually make sense or if you had a, a local improvement charges program where you could say you know i, I received ten thousand dollars in incentives it's another ten thousand dollars that i'm going to prorate over the next 20 years of my tax payments uh that makes sense i can do that so um, the problem is there, there isn't a lot of great examples of municipalities that have implemented these programs that actually achieve good success when it comes to deep, deep retrofits. Um, if you do a very significant window incentive that the province did a couple of years ago, yes, you get a lot of window replacements, but that's a very targeted and, and pretty simple program um, to do that more holistic kind of um, improvement is challenging, but that's what we need. That's what we need to do so that, you know, instead of, spending two thousand dollars in gas a year you spend 200 and then your emissions are down and you're just more efficient in general i don't know if i capture everything there <laughs> i think you got it thanks adam uh, and i know solar too you mentioned solar uh solar was something that uh the stakeholder advisory group has talked about as a strategy as well so um that is something being looked at um okay hear? Um, so I'm just looking at the clock here. We're going to have a hard time getting through our items. So thank you, Adam, uh, for that. That was very fascinating uh, and helpful. And we're looking forward to that report at the end of the month. And uh, we'll talk about setting up a meeting to talk about the, the final strategy before it goes to council as well. Thanks so much. Thanks, Adam. All right. So moving on to sidewalk accessibility and safety. So um, we had talked at our last meeting about having a conversation around our sidewalks and how do we improve uh, pedestrianization. Um, Councillor Kungle had brought up some ideas around you know, connections to the seniors advisory, the accessibility advisory, and we have Cheryl Dillon here to uh, talk about some accessibility issues. So Amory, I don't know if you wanted to sort of introduce this conversation and, and what you were thinking in terms of direction. Sure. So um, I was having a lovely conversation with a colleague of mine who uh, is a researcher professor um, at UOIT. And uh, her area is um, really on aging well and staying physically active. And she's doing a lot of actually intersection with engineers and looking at this from um, built design, your built environment. So I didn't know if there would ever be interest in actually having a joint or shared meeting. I could bring her to the table as a researcher sharing some learnings around leading practice policy, what's coming out of some of her research pieces that might align to considerations around accessibility, aging uh, well and thriving in your community, doing some dabbling around donut economics, if anyone's touching that recently, but you know, parts of um, looking at that from um, being able to thrive. Um, but really, when we talk about our work plan around sustainability and active transportation, are there shared metrics? So I'm looking at this from, would there be a joint meeting with an agenda that might have value with um, understanding, hypothetically, from Cheryl, where that seniors advisory committee is at specific to that um, age-friendly plan, right? And we had recommendations years ago, and that was provincially applauded around um, health, navigation, transportation, accessibility, um, housing, and other aspects. Um, where does that intersect or how does that interplay with your built environment and active transportation and sustainability? Um, and then also how does that interplay 
uh, when we talk a bit about opportunities around uh, improving accessibility in, in different lenses. So it might be around, is, are there synergies we're just not having conversations about more formally, you know, noting we've got, we've got staff across the board, but then is there a space to even bring in uh, Patrick Fang with the Healthy Berry Project? And Patrick's come to council. We've been trying to get him to different committees would that streamline a presentation around data on resident health that he has and he's mapped and that have been leading into conversations around food deserts to, you know, uh, different demographics around uh, one's health and chronic disease and connected communities. Another aspect we could bring in might be around what's the current status of the health accord. So we have an intentional statement and agreement with Simcoe County, RVH, Barrie Police, City of Barrie and the health unit. And there's no metrics yet to my understanding, but is there something there that we might have an opportunity to influence or become aware of around, you know, what are we all striving towards? Where are we at in our safety uh, community well being plan? And some of the things I see here also around active transportation interplay with safety and the police. So I'm wondering about if it's just a space to have a uh, good dialogue about what could benefit the collective. Uh, awareness and then is there a space for conversation with Shilpa around what's coming out of some leading research in this area and is there something that we would all be interested in taking a look at there's the idea okay there's a lot there yeah I actually think that most of that has nothing to do with the topic on the agenda so oh did I launch it <laughs> I love it all. I absolutely do. But um, nothing that you said speaks to accessibility and safety of our sidewalks. So I'm not and, really sure yeah. what to talk about. Uh, I, can't no, I can't really talk about what all those, all those wonderful ideas you had. Um, I think that's a, a separate kind of conversation for this committee. But I, I can speak to accessibility and safety of our sidewalks. That's great. And sorry, Keenan, I thought when you said share your idea that we launched into that. <laughs> I don't know, maybe one. I was confused, but uh, it's all good. It's all good. Let's yeah. let's have that conversation, the narrow conversation on, on the sidewalk accessibility and uh, we can talk per about where to Perfect. Go and then and then from from that, maybe what I can do is provide that narrow scope to then help uh, Councillor Kungal and everybody else in the committee uh, branch off into all these other different projects because you know the things that that Councillor Kungal mentioned um, are, are really quite thrilling and there are some awesome synergies I think um, that already exist within the work that's being done from from this committee and other committees and just uh, city staff in general and I think um, uh, you know, P Patrick Feng's project, uh, you know, it's really cool. And if you guys don't have a, um, an ear to that, then you definitely should. But in terms of accessibility and safety, um, it is a, a work in progress, absolutely. And one of the things that um, I think relates to some of the, the comments that Councillor Kungle has just made uh, with accessibility and safety is the fact that our new official plan will actually encompass some, some pretty robust universal design practices that um, uh, are, you know, maybe not, maybe not gonna be seen in Old Barry immediately, but certainly will be something that will affect our community and change our community and the, the streetscape of our community from an accessibility perspective um, and a safety perspective going forward for, for many years to come. And um, the, uh, the Ontario Provincial Design Standards, uh, the OPSD standards that we, we use and all municipalities use when um, uh, creating our infrastructure, our transportation infrastructure, which uh, Brett can can talk about, um, have been aligned with the AODA, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, since 2015. So everything that our staff currently do, our engineering staff, you know, like everything that they do related to creating our sidewalks um, and that that roadway infrastructure is aligned with, with our accessibility best practices. And they also do reach out to myself and the Accessibility Advisory Committee um, 
uh, quite frequently uh, related to um, large municipal projects, um, especially reconstruction projects um, and future design uh, construction, in, just in order to get something beyond the 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 uh, written requirements. So, so it's 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 all well and good for things to to work out on paper, but they they do. Um, thankfully speak to uh, myself and our accessibility advisory committee for that lived experience of disability and and um, that under that great understanding and and they also reach out um, to both myself and the accessibility advisory committee uh, for um, reconstruction projects in old Barry where it's where it's not so clear cut and where it doesn't make sense on paper, because I just, you know, just as an example, we have areas in our city that you can kind of date based on the sidewalk construction. So, you know, um, there, we have areas in um, East, um, I'm just thinking like East Barry, downtown and East, where the sidewalks are a meter wide. And so right now our standard is 1.5 meters um, in some areas, 1.8, if it's an active transportation node and a high commercial um, area. So, you know, it's quite different. And so you can imagine in a neighborhood where a sidewalk was built and it's one meter wide sidewalk and that neighborhood, that roadway, the infrastructure underneath that road um, and the houses that are surrounding it, they're all impacted. And so for us as a municipality to just decide, hey, we're gonna make everything 1.5 meters, it's it would not be, it would not be responsible, it would not be possible. You know, it would it 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 would be, I can't even imagine it would be quite well, I'm sure there's people on this call who who have the professional background and expertise to understand just what a, a circus that would be, literally and figuratively. Um, now, having said that, that doesn't mean that we're not taking steps and measures to make those spaces as accessible as possible. Um, so the AODA, like the building code, is not retroactive. So it's it's a proactive kind of kind of thing. So it's on a go forward basis. So obviously, any new development is going to be um, is going to benefit the most. But as we are um, reconstructing areas in Olderberry. Um, we're always making sure that we're bringing everything up to the newest standard possible. Um, and in some cases we're bringing, we are making those one point, those one meter sidewalks, 1.5 meter sidewalks where we can. And in, in other areas, we just can't because we would, it would require us to um, to do either, you know, too much to the infrastructure underneath the, the roadway, or it would require us to buy property and things like that. And, and, and that's just not what we're, we're doing. So we're, we're making other, um, in those cases, sometimes what we've done is we've made other um, allowances to improve accessibility in those spaces um, so that we're still making sure that we're, we're keeping our residents and, and pedestrians in mind. Um, uh, but also, you know, um, being true to the environment that 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 neighborhood was built in, you know, if it was like built, you know, significant quite quite a while ago. So um, I'm really, really supportive of the work that's gone into our official plan related to the universal design um, guidelines. And um, so is our accessibility advisory committee. Uh, I think our staff. Um, have, you know, they're still, you know, accepting some, some, they're going through that process, accepting uh, comments and things like that um, from, from other um, individuals. But I think at the end, when we are, we're finalized and we've presented that to the province, I think the province also will be quite um, happy with, with what we're proposing here as a community. And I think um, as we develop, you know, we are a place to, to grow. And as we are growing, I think it's going to be really cool because we're going to see these elements, these accessibility elements that are going to impact all ages and stages of individuals, um, you know, and together that universal design with intensification and um, 
uh, thing, you know, active transportation, uh, you know, nodes and, and improvements throughout the city, the different corridors that, that are being worked on by Brett and his team. I think it's really going to, if you fast forward 20 years, it's going to be really amazing. It's, it's going to, we're going to see the fruits of, of your labor. Thanks for that uh, overview. I, one question I did, did have that I wanted to ask was around snow clearing um, with sidewalks and the accessibility of our sidewalks in the winter. I know a lot of people, transit users, uh, you know, just pedestrians have a hard time uh, getting around. Is that something yeah. that the Accessibility Advisory Committee has talked about? Oh, the absolutely. Level, they about they think that council should heat the sidewalks. So if you want to get on that, that'd be great. No, I'm joking. <laughs> No, but all serious, that does come up every once in a while. Um, so snow is very difficult. It's controversial. Uh, every winter, I think our call volume goes up um, significantly related to snow clearing. Uh, so we do talk about that. And that is being considered um, in the design of our spaces related to um uh, our sidewalks. So for example, uh, when our sidewalks, uh, when we're looking at reconstructing, uh, when site plans come, come in, uh, our operation staff do comment related to their ability to, to get their, their snow clearing vehicles onto the sidewalks, uh, to move, maneuver around the spaces. Um, we are commenting, um, for, for, um, one thing that's, Unfortunately, something we've seen, uh, it, snow clearing often happens and this, the snow is left in the accessible parking space. Uh, so that's something that we're, we're constantly having to, to communicate that, that the accessible parking space is used like all other parking spaces and to, to keep that and the access aisles clear. So there's no good solution to that. And I have reached out to municipalities in Alberta, um, uh, Manitoba, as well as out east, who have uh, so similar snow volumes and um, temperature issues that, that we experience in, in, uh, in Barrie. And they, they all offer a variety of different um, ideas but no one's got a good clear solution it just seems to be something that we we tackle but um i think now that we have have um brought in operations to those those initial conversations so that they're part of the the conversation at the beginning of a, of a design it's helping so i don't know like we're this is one of those things where hindsight's going to tell us whether we're doing the right thing but um uh, you know, it, and also you, met, you mentioned climate change um, earlier in your discussions and it depends on the year. So like last year we had hardly any snow. Mm -hmm. So we had zero complaints. No, I'm, we had lots of complaints, but, but we didn't, we didn't have as many maybe incidences that we would have this, this year. So um, yeah, it's, it's always on our radar every, every winter. It's, it's something that we, we talk about. Tyler, I see your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, just a, a, a quick question. Uh, and I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer Cheryl if it's more a, a question for engineering and operations. But um, you mentioned uh, in older parts of the city where the sidewalks are presently undersized. Is it right to assume that as we go to upgrade the right of way in those portions of the city that we will consider a wider sidewalk if possible? Um, it, my, uh, understanding is that it depends. So, so I spoke last week with, um, uh, Adam Kiley, uh, who's a engineer manager in engineering, um, about exactly this issue. And, and he did assure me that in some cases, in some instances that is being, that is, that is occurring, uh, with, with the, the neighborhood, you know, um, you know, case by case kind of scenario. So the other thing that we're doing in Barrie that we've started to do recently, which I, I love, and we get compliments from, 
from community members all the time. I get these random phone calls from community members telling me how excited they are about our sidewalk in, in certain areas. Uh, so um, we're starting to um, ensure that that um, uh, dummy joints are no longer included in our sidewalks. So dummy joints they're not expansion joints. They're not, they're actually optional. They've been optional for provincial engineering standards for some time, but it's kind of one of those cases that we always did something. Our contractors were always um, doing something in one way. And um, we recently with a number of our different projects, the Lakeshore project, uh, the Wellington street uh, sidewalk reconstruction and addition uh, and a number of other sidewalks in the city have, have, either removed the the dummy joints completely or they've gone to um uh, saw cut joints and the community loves it individuals with disabilities love it their caregivers love it um seniors love it so i get i i get the funniest phone calls and and uh um and i it's interesting because when we first started having this conversation People were concerned about rogue skateboarders, you know, having too smooth a surface and they would become, um, uh, you know, a menace or something like that. But that just has never happened. And it's just been something that's uh, been been appreciated. So in those areas where we're able to in Olderberry create um a, a one like a bring a bring the sidewalk from one meter to to 1.5 meters for example we're we're also going to be uh trying to improve the accessibility of the overall you know concrete space so yes took me a lot of words to say yeah <laughs> that's sorry. good to hear no that's it thanks cheryl okay so on this sidewalk accessibility piece, uh, did we did we have thoughts on if we wanted, like, where did we want to take this as a committee? Did we want to take this further? Does it sound like we, you know, there was just a point of information. We can move on to the the bigger conversation that uh, Anne Marie brought in if we, if we want. I think I think it's um, connected to all those bigger things that you guys mm -hmm. are talking about. Certainly, sidewalks and safety. Sidewalks are are uh, pivotal for any um, good active transportation network. So I think it's always going to be kind of woven into the mm -hmm. the overarching conversation that you guys are going to be having here at at this this committee. And I'm always happy to. Uh, to come and, and talk to you about any concerns you might have or ideas you might have um, to innovate that space. Um, and uh, I, there's others within the corporation who I think could also assist in that. But I think the one message that I would like to leave with you is that, um, that myself and staff generally, um, as well as the Accessibility Advisory Committee, I think really support the idea of ensuring that we have safe, accessible sidewalks and that and plans are in place to, to make those improvements constantly. Um, so we we definitely um, are are looking to that. So great. Um, I saw John's hand and then Eric, your hands up as well. So and, we'll go ahead. and then we'll go to Al. Go ahead, John. OK, so and I'm not sure. You're, thanks. Thanks, Cheryl, for coming out. Um, I think it's I guess I'm, I get really stuck up on this uh, snow clearing item of it because I think it's I think it's so critical in you know we're trying to change behavior and then all of a sudden there's a huge snowstorm and you're forcing someone to take a behavior that you know any behavior that we any behavior change that we've we've achieved we're forcing them to find another you know uh, way to to travel so is that uh, are we should we be, are we better off to talk to operations with that stuff Cheryl or is like do you think that's you guys are pushing it I I appreciate that is it. Is that is it? Should we get operations to discuss that 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 item? I mean, I mean, I understand it's. Um... I think it's multi pronged, John. Like really, truly, it's like uh, operate. Like you certainly could bring operations in, but I know because we I talk to them frequently, and I and they also see some of the complaints that I see, uh, and and they're working really hard on this issue. Uh, so it's like I think it's it's city. It's a city issue, it's an environmental issue, 
And it's also just like a community issue, the community that we live in and the lake effects that we experience. Um, and so like, there's no perfect, I don't know the perfect solution just, just yet because, because um, I think people are making those efforts. They're, they're really trying. Um, and, and, and I'm hoping I'm crossing my fingers right now because I, I haven't, I haven't um, had too many um, snow storage complaints lately and we've had a lot of snow lately. So usually, you know, they kind of run in parallel um, and I'm, you know, so I, I don't want to jinx myself, but, but I think it's, it's one of those things where um, it's never going to be one and done, you know, like we're going to be having this conversation probably every year for years. And I, and, and I don't mean to say that the people that hear it the first time aren't going to be improving and changing. It's just that like, there's so many players involved. Like we have contracted snow removal um, uh, staff and we do have some people that, that, you know, return to us year after year after year, but we also have people that, that are new. And so they go through snow, snow school, snow training. Um, and, and these things are covered, but you still, we still have to, you know, do spot checks. We still have to respond to complaints and address those complaints, um, every single time they happen, you know? So, um, like, I think it, it would, it would be good to have, like, to have that, concerted conversation with as many of these players as possible but I just um I don't know that it's going to be an easy fix I guess is what I'm trying to say like I just if you have ideas on how that might happen I think we would all be open to them mm -hmm. um so I think if it, it yeah like it's not possible for us to say it's never going to happen again, even after we do a, a big training or a big campaign or anything like that, like it just, it, it just gets better over time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I guess what I was thinking was, you know, if we're doing long-term stuff to me, it's, it's uh, a prioritization uh, discussion on what, 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 you know, the staff we have, you know, the resources we have, what are we mm -hmm. prioritizing? Mm -hmm. And then also future fleet, I guess, which is sort of still one of the prioritization. Like, yeah. And that would definitely be an operations. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. want to bring them in for that conversation for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Eric. Yeah, thank you, Keenan. Cheryl, a question for you um, as a active transportation user and being on this committee, um, I, I use sidewalks quite a bit cycling, <clears throat> not just walking uh, where permitted. My understanding is the bylaws in, in the suburb areas and outside of the city core, you're allowed to do that, obviously giving right of way to pedestrians, but the, the reason I'm bringing it up is from this committee's point of view, is that something we should be talking about and promoting as part of, I do personally, I tell people, hey, ride the sidewalks. It's great. There's no cars. Mm -hmm. um, should we be doing that as a committee or not? I don't understand your question. Like for, for you, should you do promoting that for people with disabilities? No, sorry, for active transportation, for active transportation? like me riding a bicycle. Riding a bicycle? I think it's your comfort level as a cyclist. So I think some cyclists obviously have a much more confidence um, cycling with traffic uh, than, than others. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, young children, older adults may not have that level of confidence. Uh, you know, so I don't know that, I don't know that you would want to, as a committee promote that necessarily, I think probably as a active transportation committee, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think ultimately you want to promote safe, active transportation, whatever that might look like. So it might look one way for you uh, and it might look something different for someone else. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not certain I have the best answer to that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right. I'll, was next, and then Kevin, and then I saw Anne Marie. Thanks, Kim. Um, so, uh, my comment about the uh, accessibility and, and uh, safety for sidewalks is I think we need to do a better job. And this is not a slam of faulting city staff, this is just the kind of results that we have. Um, 
you know, what can they do with the resources they have? And usually those are financial resources. But we use we use plows. I live on, I'm a block away from Codrington School. There's a sidewalk across the front of my property because we're that close to the school, even though it's a very local one and a half block long street. Um, we use plows on the sidewalks. And from my perspective, a lot of the time that's useless. Blowers don't, you know, blowers can get snow out of the way and leave it on the curb. Um, and, uh, and plows just make a hump across the front of your driveway. Um, the, we have several seasons in, 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 our, in our winter in Barrie. We have snow, which has been talked about a lot. Then we have the flood, then, then we get warmer temperatures, which turns to the thaw season, which then turns to the flooding season, which then turns to the ice season as soon as the, uh, as soon as the temperature drops again, which it just has in the last 48 hours. So it, it's, it's an, un, an absolutely thankless task to try and, and maintain it. Uh, but I, I think we, and, and in this, as we go on into the spring, we will have for the next month and a half, we will have differential flooding because we'll have places where the sidewalk, maybe it hasn't cracked and broken up, but it's slumped and the ground around it is a little higher and the sidewalk will be effectively impassable uh, for a lot of users because it'll there'll be um, an inch or two inches or even more perhaps in some places of, of slush and which will become just you know melted cold crappy water all over the thing and it can't drain off because there's snow all over you know still piled up and frozen from the winter on both sides of the sidewalk so it, it's um, uh, Another issue in with it is the uh, uh, the extent of uh, of salt use by contractors because I've seen in in my own neighborhood within the last let's say two years ago uh, places where there was a you know the the little plow thing with the salt or sand trailer behind it but there were clumps of salt and near corners which is the First place, it's likely to run off into our storm system, which is going to go directly into, in most cases, into Lake Simcoe. And Lake Simcoe has a huge and growing fluoride problem right now, and you can't get it out of the water. So those are some of the, I think a lot of them are maintenance issues. Yeah. And and they, they need to be, I think for the old, Cheryl said, hey, you know, the standards we're going to have in place for the new building stuff, yeah, uh, we very hard to apply a lot of those standards to the to old Barry, and we we need to do everything that we can to make our existing system work better for yeah. people. Yeah, I I think the comments um, that you're making, Al, I think those really are operational comments. Um, so, I like the city does um, participate in the. Uh oh, you froze, Cheryl. So you're did back. I? You're back. Though. Okay. So, so the city okay, does so participate asked, in the Ontario Salt Aware program. Okay. Is that is that working? You heard that? Okay. Yeah. Technology, so fun. Uh, so so it does, but I have heard your the complaint that you're bringing up um, about the clumping uh, from other residents. Al, so I think that is due to old equipment. So we're using old equipment, um, uh, you know, uh, so I, I, I can't speak to why that might happen the way it happens. Um, but uh, I think Craig Morton and his team would be really happy to come and talk to you. And, and they are working at innovating as best they can, you know, so, so like there's always there's always things that we can improve on. And so if, if you as a committee have ideas and suggestions that they um, might benefit from, I think they'd be well, like they'd be yeah. they'd welcome that. I really do. Like they're a great group of people. So sure. uh, I want to go to Kevin. because He's had his hand up for a while. Go ahead, Kevin. Hi, Kevin. Uh, I was just going to jump in and try to help Cheryl with this one. Oh, <laughs> it's sweating. No, I'm just... no, that's all right. <laughs> cool. Sweat doesn't hurt anyone. Um, yeah. yeah, Craig Morton would be the great guy to come and talk to the committee and answer specific questions about how 
the sidewalks get maintained to the minimum maintenance standards of Ontario and, and the processes they use and the salts and, and the rationale for clumping where it happens. Um, there's also a good page on winter maintenance on the city's website. It kind of describes what they're doing, why they're doing it, and there's daily updates on uh, priority routes and salt routes and uh, sidewalk sanding and plowing and stuff. So that, you know, if somebody wanted to go on and see what was going on today in their area, they could track it. Hmm. Who's out there? But definitely, I think uh, Craig Morton would be great to invite to the committee and, and chat about it if you want to explore it in more detail. That's great. Thank you. And I think, I mean, it's a broader conversation too around snow clearing and active transportation infrastructure as we bring on new infrastructure in the city, we're going to have to deal with those operational costs and make sure they're accessible year round. So that's probably an important conversation for us to have. And Marie, I think you had your hand up as well. Go ahead. Sure. And I'll try and link this to, to maybe um, how it comes back to accessibility as a committee, but within the next, later conversation if we get deep into it is about our website update and other assets and in that we've talked a bit about the benefit of a button um, where if you you're walking or you're taking a mode of active transportation and you see something that you notice um, uh, perhaps um, you know we can ping potholes and have them serviced you know how do we use some of the apps and technology like ping street to even identify pooling on a sidewalk, issues with the different notes? And does that become a feedback loop that supports accessibility um, and opportunities oh, for improvement? To totally, I use Pink Street all the time and I know city staff probably hate me for it. Cause when I walk my dog and I see stuff, I take pictures and I send it to them. And then I get emails saying, thanks Cheryl, we're on this with like rolling eyes kind of thing. So like they, I think, I think in, in most cases they're on it, but they can't be everywhere all the time. And, and so I know for myself, when I have community members contact me about accessibility concerns, it, even if it's a complaint, I'm really grateful because that's something I didn't know about before. So, so I think um, if you are able to, uh, at like your network of active transportation um, uh, users, both individually and your friends and all the rest, um, like you're gonna be places and spaces that city staff are not gonna be on a regular rotating basis. So, so if you're seeing something that you just don't feel is safe or accessible or whatever, I think, um, yeah, t take, take a picture if you can, pink, put it on Pink Street and, and that's a great feedback loop. Absolutely. So maybe we'll reconnect as we develop that website out with you and the committee, Cheryl. That would be wonderful. Get. Yeah. And just one more thing to say about that. Anything you do from a website perspective has to be accessible. So we have requirements for that. So just, yeah, just, just Wait. keep that in the back of your mind. Thanks. Okay. Um, we're, quickly running out of time here i feel like okay i'm gonna thank you so much <laughs> this was you great so you much. guys are a great committee i'm gonna i'm gonna skedaddle all right thank you so much for your Thanks. time take care okay so the next item on the agenda um i just want to quickly get us uh to form a subcommittee on this one um to look at the application for the bicycle friendly communities because there's a i don't know if everyone had a chance to look through the documentation from the previous application um, and maybe we can discuss when we want to do that because the applications for this current intake period and April 9th, I have a feeling we probably won't make that deadline, but uh, I think we could at least have a committee start working on the application, review the previous application where we missed um, points and uh, go from there. John, I saw you unmute for a second there. I don't know if you had a thought. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you caught me there. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, I think that's great. Yeah, I saw it was March or April uh, 9th, which I, I think there is, I think that Bicycle Friendly Community is a great uh, checklist and it's a great tool that we can use. And I think, you know, there are experts there helping us out with it. I, I don't, I think for me anyway, I think for us to go through it and pick out a couple ones that we think we can achieve by next year, let's let's figure out what we can do um, and, and go through it that way rather than going through the process that's my comment. I'm happy to help out either way. If we decide to go through the process, I'm happy to help out with that. But that's, that's my thought on it. Yeah. I, I like that idea. Some achievable things that we, they pointed out in the last application and we weren't successful and then 
start working on those. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. And then, yeah, I guess because yeah, two of the things that they pointed out. Well, I mean, they had the active transportation coordinator, which is a little bit tougher for us to to do. But it, a lot of that stuff was education and encouragement, which which are things that I think we can really do um, and do well. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Emery. And I'm wondering to build on John's points if some of the work on our website might also lead us or this, some of those pieces, John, I think around picking what we want to do, then become deliberate aspects of, you know, how we are communicating and interacting with the public in that way and might set us up for success to go for designation next year. I'm, I'm assuming it's an annual and this time next year we could maybe be in a very strategic position to, to easily get the designation. Mm -hmm. uh, Brett, I see your hand. Uh Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to share some information. So with the uh, cycle barrier infrastructure program, there's a lot of synergies with that, and that might position us a lot better potentially in a year to two from now. Um, one of the things I did skim through the application and the feedback, which the feedback I found really interesting, um, the education outreach, as John mentioned, um, that's going to be a component of the cycle berry program where I would want the consultant to develop an education and outreach program that we could potentially go out to market to have that deliver for the city as a bridging gap until we've grown enough to really have that as a full-time position. So that was kind of one of the bigger things they picked up in the feedback. The other element was some of the safety uh, concerns. Um, so we're also participating with the Ontario Traffic Council um, on the Vision Zero guideline development. So we're on the steering committee for that. We've financially contributed. So just, I know there's probably some overlap with um, some other agenda items, but we have a lot of kind of uh, processes going on in the background with a traffic calming policy update happening in 2021, but once, which is a piece of Vision Zero. So our thought on Vision Zero uh, from a staff perspective is we're going to get through the guideline development with the OTC, and then we could use that guideline to guide a city Vision Zero policy once that's completed. So I just wanted to share that with the committee. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, that was something that really jumped out in that uh, in the application. The highest rate of collisions and deaths involving people on bikes of any community reviewed through the program. That is upsetting to hear. So that should be a motivator for, for us uh, and for council uh, going forward. But that's good to hear that that work's being uh, done. So what do we think? Do we, because it sounds like we're not ready to make an application anytime soon. Uh, it's probably not worth our time to go through the whole application process yet. Um, but is the, am I hearing that there is, though, that our work plan is trying to successfully apply a year from now for cycle designation and pedestrian friendly designation and choosing what would best meet our gaps and focusing our attention there for the next year and a bit on some of these tactics? Yeah, I, th I think over the next year, we could do some of that work. We could strike a subcommittee right now to review the past documentation and what next steps we can take. Um, Brett, when do you anticipate the Cycleberry program to sort of be more fully developed with the consultant? Like, is that a year out more? Yeah, so we're just working on the RFP right now. So we hope to have a consultant retained by late April uh, timeframe. And the program is probably going to be 12 to 16 months, roughly. Um, okay. It's fairly robust in its scope. Uh, there'll also be public information centers throughout it and a, a potential stakeholder advisory committee to provide some uh, input as well that could be members of the Active Transportation and Sustainability Committee. Okay. Right, and that's something we can note in our, if we do do the application in a year's time, we can note that that work is underway and, and point to that um, to support. Um, so do we have interest from people who would kind of like to sit down and, and focus our efforts um, for the next year's application process? Kelly, John, I would love to be involved as well, Anne-Marie, okay. So maybe the, the four of us can connect if, and, and if there's anyone else, don't hesitate to reach out uh, and we can go through that documentation and find sort of the, the low hanging fruit. Okay, that's great. All right. Um, and 
don't hesitate to interrupt if I've missed anything. I'm just now panicking with the time and trying to rush through. Uh, okay, so naturalization of Crompton Park subcommittee. Has there been an update on that? Can skip that? We can skip it. It's a standing item, so I'll have one uh, in the following month. Okay, sounds good. So that brings us to the web page, though. So, uh, Emory, you had sent out an email with sort of the updated information. Um, yeah, did you, yeah, go ahead. So maybe as a next step. So, um, wasn't sure how much time we'd have on the agenda to talk about this, so I'll streamline mm -hmm. it. I sent everyone, in case you haven't been in that shared Google Drive, the current status. So I actually just attached it and sent it out to the full membership group if you wanted to make reference to it now or, or later as convenient. Um, but that's kind of the, the content, unless anyone thinks there's something missing, that we would then take a next step and maybe engage, I believe it is a city staff member, around what's possible around the functionality. So I was going to highlight some aspects there, but I think they're they're kind of they're kind of chunked out. Um, I do want to do a shout out to John and Sherry, who basically populated the whole like the amount of resources that they both brought to the table and and conversations too. I think were great, and in particular, you know the the mindfulness that Sherry brought to say make sure we're staying in an active transportation, not a recreation lens, and that. Um, we're taking that that lens and approach to actually what we're adding and and making sure that we're staying true to that scope. So um, I'm not sure if we want to set a timeline for any other additional information or the next step would be that small group having a conversation with staff or giving it to staff and saying, what do you think? And uh, anything that doesn't fit or isn't possible that we need to revisit. Yeah, and I would like to ask Brett, like, Brett, what would you prefer in terms of um working through these suggestions uh, and, and getting them on the website? Like, what do you need from us to, to make this happen? Yeah, I'm just looking at the, the document right now. I think what might be a good first step would be myself to speak with Access Berry offline just to see how we could package this in an, an effective way that might not be too overwhelming to a member of the public. Mm -hmm. um, there's, just a, there's a lot of great stuff here, but that might be... Uh, there's pros and cons to that. Yeah. So, um, so I might do that first because they have that skill set that uh, uh, to look at that and we can come back with a bit of a recommendation and just get what their thoughts are on this. Um, and I could do that potentially uh, with report back for the next meeting. That'd be fantastic. Uh, John, I think I see your hand. Sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to, cause some of that stuff I put in there, a huge list. I, I know we wanted to stay away from huge lists. And when I'm seeing that, when, when I'm, Putting that stuff in there, I'm I'm envisioning that as being kind of drop down list. If someone wants to know what in each thing is, I think because yeah, I don't, I don't want to scare anyone with a yeah giant you know essay about tra active transportation. So, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so uh, so Brett, that document that we have is enough for you to go to Access Berry and sort of get a sense for what we can put together. Yeah. So just to be clear, we'll report back on just what we have here and just our thoughts on moving forward. Um, yeah, the next meeting will be finished product, but we'll uh, we'll be moving this forward. Okay. Yeah, and I think the you've been part of all those conversations to date too. I think Brett at this committee around is it possible to have it more icon level? I think was a uh, interest oh, area cool. versus content heavy. The, I think there were some previous suggestions about if if that could be um, a different visual navigation uh, around where we land for some some pieces. But yeah, no, absolutely. I'll speak, with, I'll speak with Access Barry to see what they can do from a, a, a web page development to uh, maybe move us away from less words, more icons for sure. Perfect. That's great. My only yeah. other question that may or may not fit with the Access Barry, and we can move this to a next meeting, is then having some of those maybe more focused conversations about using an app or Strava. Um, so where do we go around, you know, content, what's possible um, around the website, around navigating to some additional information. But I, I want to make sure we don't miss an opportunity to also talk a bit about how do we support activating individuals um, around adopting um, and or um, being attracted to take some opportunities, but also share different routes across the communities. So I'm not sure if that where that fits, but I think we talked a bit about using an app whether it's Ping Street or something else, um, or Strava or adopting another piece, would that be something, Brett, that you would be bringing back? Any concepts or considerations? Or is that 
a different direction we need to take? I've had an initial conversation with uh, our ITGIS group and kind of the initial response was they're fairly resource limited, but what I'll do is kind of pull the location-based comments or kind of mapping-based comments from this list and just revisit that with them to see uh, what ability they might have to, uh, to provide some of these services. We might rely on linking to third-party platforms, um, but also if there's members of the community, the cycling community, um, that have suggestions um, above and beyond this. I haven't read this yet, so maybe it's contained within. But if there's a, a thought on how we should be doing something, I'm happy to receive that, so. Okay. Uh, John, is that a new hand? Yeah. Sorry, it is a new one, sorry. Yeah, with that with that Strava stuff, uh, and maybe Eric can comment on it too. So I, I was thinking, um, if it's a, even if it's a link there and, and notifying people that that data, that, you know, that information Whenever they ride Strava, we're we're looking at that data because that might be something that people don't realize is that if you are if that we are looking at that, so they can think, oh well, I, I want to keep using this this route that I use, but it's not very good. They that information is passed along, and we can we can make use of it. So, just just a thought there on that one. Right. So just yeah. an education piece on that, Eric. Sorry, that's a good point, John. And uh, just to reconfirm. Uh, that the city is using, or at least buying that data from Strava, correct? So my understanding, it was, I think purchased through uh, Rob Meyer's organization for a single year. And that's okay. where we're at with that data. We didn't find okay. it overly useful. We have found uh, a new service through Streetlight data, um, but it's uh, cost prohibitive at this point, uh, which was a bit discouraging. It uses location-based services to uh, really, it's a multimodal transportation planning analytic tool. It's basically almost real time. It's quite incredible. I encourage you to check out some of their demos online. Um, but the uh, the full multimodal service package was in the uh, very low six figures for an annual subscription. So it was quite costly, uh, but it is an incredible tool. So we are still looking at ways we might be able to uh, make a business plan to at least partially get some of that data. Um, because there are benefits with traffic calming um, and a lot of inquiries, complaints, concerns that are related to traffic operations, whether it's cut through traffic, speeding, um, it's all real-time data that's just a couple clicks away, uh, which would have taken a week or two to gather. So it's just a, a little aside, it's quite interesting, but it's uh, unfortunately with that uh, comes a, a sizable cost. What's the name of that platform, Brett? It's called Streetlight Data. I'll check it out. Thank you. Maybe we can get uh, Mike McCann to fundraise for it. Um, <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. On the web page. So it sounds like we're, we, we're good. We have a game plan. Anything else to add on that? Emery? We're unmuting. No? Okay. Uh, okay. Then moving on. So the urban design guidelines, we had talked about doing what we did with the official plan. Um, where we start the subcommittee to review that. Is that something we want to do? Do we feel we have capacity to do that? How are people th feeling? I know, Tyler, you kind of led some of that effort on the OP. Yeah. Um, so my understanding is now there's going to be a second round of consultation and there'll be another comment period following. So notwithstanding the fact I don't want to be in the same position as we were last time, trying to cram and get through a review in two weeks. Um, I think we have a bit of time to breathe here. I know um, I've got almost no capacity for the month of March, um, but that still gives us April and May down the road potentially to spend some time looking at this. And okay. it, a part of me it, um, sort of feels like it, it might be um, more responsible in terms of our time resources to wait for a revised set of guidelines if that is indeed <clears throat> coming and someone might be able to speak to that i don't know if um the second round of consultation is just centered around the official plan or if the guidelines are also going to be revisited so i can i can check on that i'll touch base with the planning department and see um i think that's a good suggestion though we if like if we do have time then let's not rush into it and a little, um, little faster than uh or a little further out than two weeks this time, though, if we could. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. <laughs> okay. 
Yes, Al, go ahead. Uh, yeah, did, so has the city hired somebody else? Because Kathy Suggett left at, uh, I believe, the end of January. Has the city uh, yet hired somebody to you know, be in charge of that? Or is it uh, basically uh, Thomas Wiersma, who was her assistant on that? Is Thomas sort of pulling it together? And, and do we know, do we know whether they, as, as uh, Tyler just alluded to, are, are they, um, did they, did they get much feedback on the urban design guidelines or are they mainly just focusing on the official plan? Just some, some clarification on, uh, on where that's at. So we, we know what, what options we have to, uh, to comment and stuff. Yeah, uh, I I can get that uh, that info from the planning department on what they're looking for in terms of public comment in this next round. Um, I see Brett's hand, so we'll go to him in a second. But I think Thomas is still the the lead on that. But uh, yeah, go ahead, Brett, you have something to add? Um, yeah. So it, the process is moving forward um, under Thomas, but recruitment is well underway as well. So that process is happening as well. And as far as commenting, I, I believe it is uh, it is on the table for the second round of uh, consultation um, because there's uh, quite a bit of feedback from the engineering side as well, just to make sure that fits within the actual corridors we have. So just to uh, from take the architectural slant from the first round and then just uh, a little bit of grounding from the engineering perspective. So um, there'll be some changes on on that, but I believe you're, uh, yeah, that'll be definitely on the table. Okay, hey, Marie. So maybe from a timeline, just an appreciation to Tyler um, uh, of what at least I think is public facing from uh, forecasting the next stage. It states on the buildingberry.ca site that the draft two of the official plan will be released for another round of public consultation in May. So I'm wondering if um, Keenan, if when we're engaging Michelle or, or others within that uh, department, if um, what's the lag between the May release of um, draft two and when they're closing the door on consultations, because it looks like there might be a public meeting at the end of May. Um, but other than that, um, do we have a pathway to have a more direct conversation or, or provide uh, direct feedback in a, in a certain area, whether it's having someone come to the meeting in May or whether it's, um, holding maybe a, a special meeting or conversation mid-May, knowing that it's coming out? If, if they're talking about uh, having a, a you know, consultation, but then a public meeting by the end of May, then um, uh, that's, not, uh, that's not a lot of time to do uh, review. That's like, you know, that's the statutory public meeting, I suspect, and yes. then would go to council. So, uh, I don't think we have a lot of time um, to uh, to do this. If we're going to do something, we need to we need to get at it right away with whoever's in a position to contribute to that, mm. and have a submission sort of by April. Is that what you're thinking of? Well, unfortunately, as Tyler and I are well aware, is it's another one of those choke choke a horse. Uh, size of documents and it, it it's, I haven't looked at the urban design guidelines in any detail yet but it it's it, there's probably a fair amount of technical stuff in there and I don't know how um, as I say I, I, I can't really comment on how much I think we can do with it because I'm, I'm not familiar with with the document that's out there I'm willing to have a go at it but um, did I apologize if I, I missed it. Was there um, an anticipated timeline when they wanted to have the final document back to council for? Well, it looks like they're going for a public meeting by the end of May. Yeah, yeah that's the just a public meeting. There'll be potential revisions subsequent to that. Well, um, I, I, I think some of the earlier discussion was suggesting that uh, there was gonna be probably a fairly short timeline maybe only such as is required by statute, which could be like 20 days or something yeah. like that from the public right. meeting to when council actually makes yeah. a decision on the thing. That's so, definitely uh, possible. Yeah. Anything, Do you think there, yeah. yeah. I think there could be an outreach to see if there's a section specific to that topic that we could, uh, they could share with us around what's already been incorporated and 
um, seeing if we could get them to prepare to at least bring something back verbally to us or a draft in some way, knowing that we do want to build in time to give feedback uh, and review rather than waiting for the full draft to be released publicly if there's a process that's available to us. Yeah, I mean, we do have the current draft. It's just whether they're making substantial changes before the next yeah. one, I guess, is the question that we want to ask. Yeah. Okay, I can follow up with uh, my department on that. Yeah, yeah and if, we don't, if we don't want to, if uh, we don't want to wait uh, a month before getting the ball rolling on, maybe Keenan, you can just follow up and let everyone yeah. know if if yeah. there's not going to be substantial changes to the guidelines, we can have that discussion. But if there is, then we, it's probably wise to wait. So. Sure. Okay. So I'll do that. Um, just looking at the clock here, we're over our time. Um, I feel like this meeting was a little bit harried and all over the place. <laughs> and so uh, if there are any suggestions or comments on the way the meetings are run or any items that we think we need to really pick up the pace on or focus on, um, please reach out and, and let me know. Um, and uh, we'll go from there. I'll, I'll compile a list of action items and uh, we can follow up uh, after the meeting. But uh, is there anything else that anyone wanted to raise before we end? Um, Keenan? Go, go ahead, Al, and then we'll go to uh, Yeah, just a quick question. I'm not sure why I'm not able to connect in by video, and that also means that you can't see, and I have nothing on my screen, which I have with other Zoom things, that says I can raise hand. So I don't know uh, whether uh, whether this is a problem somehow between, you know, my 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 webcam and stuff and, and the city system, because it seems to work, it's been working fine with other Ones, but I, I think I had the same problem with our last ATNS meeting. So, um, Tara, yeah. can I talk? Get in touch with you. Or are you able to help help me out with this stuff potentially? Yeah, um, yeah. If you want to contact me, and I'll see if we can get it figured out for you. Okay, great. Thank you. Awesome, Emory. Uh, next agenda. Could I? Could yes. I? <laughs> Add that left fielder. I knew we were oh, trying yes. to fit it in somewhere, and I didn't know if that was my right. signal to launch into if there was value around uh, bringing in a researcher in a related field and having a conversation across some of the committees, whether it's now or a year from now or or if at all. But um, I know we've got some good traction on our work plan, um, but it feels me because of where I'm sitting, there's so many opportunities to bridge some of the conversation and see how what we're doing here might uh, interplay with others. Um, mm -hmm. So so I'll leave it there if that's of interest. And then the other one would be the uh, conversation if it fits here, if not, I'll take it to city building, but the Barry is a B city, anything okay. uh, we right. would have an opinion on about the pollinator bus stop roofs. Okay, so those are two items. Do you, do you wanna add them to the next agenda right at the top of the list? We can do that. Sure. If they fit, and then I'll look and, to the group to let Tara know if they don't yeah. think it's uh, this is the space for that, but sure. I think I could benefit from a little bit more information on what what we want that the focus of that conversation between the other committees to be. Um, I think I'm having a hard time grasping exactly what synergies we want to focus on and how we want that to look. Um, so maybe if you can think about that and, and let Tara and I know before we put that sure. on the agenda then. I can circulate if you want. I think I shared a draft agenda and opportunities, but okay. Oh, okay. Uh, we can connect on it, yeah. Okay. All right, great. Anything else before we head out? Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Always a pleasure. And uh, don't hesitate to reach out in between meetings if you need anything at all, okay? All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.